Good morning. Today we're going to talk about CMA versus appraisal. We have with us Colin Lord from Absolute Value, and he's going to speak to us about the difference between a CMA and an appraisal, what is included in an appraisal, appraisal issues 101, and answer our questions. Thank you very much for being here. All right. Thank you for having me, sis. The, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great topic, and it's, uh, it's an important one to um, not only talk about today, but to, to really put a lot of effort into uh, researching Listening um, and, and and attempting to understand it to your best of the ability um, what actually goes into an appraisal and what is the difference between that and a CMA. Um, my history is that I was I've been appraising for thirty years or so, um, and there's been various changes to the industry that have led to. It's been a sort of a tumultuous time period, but um, all the changes usually take place after a, a, some type of a crisis. So. Um, licensing um, was implemented in 1991 um, only after a, a major sort of, it's called the sit, uh, Savings and Loan Bailout um, and, but prior to that no appraisers had to be licensed um, I don't actively appraise, I should say, in the field anymore because in 2009 I created a company which is referred to as a, an appraisal management company or an AMC um, and an AMC was required, um, and some people, some banks, lenders use um, my company or companies like mine um, because of uh, federal changes to lending laws, which was to um, was an attempt to prevent or reduce pressure on appraisers um, to hit a certain target value. Um, a lot of the focus of the financial crisis in 07, 08, and so forth, um, as we all are aware of, um, it was blamed not just on lending, on lending programs, but appraisers, and so on and so forth. So to create objectivity in the process, um, there is no more um, communication between a loan officer and a real estate appraiser. And what this has done it has allowed real estate appraisers to... Um, work in the, the profession the way that it was designed for. Um, now I will say that simultaneously along with it and along with a lot of finger pointing and, and various sort of court cases and, and, and lice disciplinary actions is that I've, I've seen um, appraisers be a little bit more cautious um, and a little bit more conservative at times um, and but you know, at the same time, more realistic. And um, at the end of the day, I think what you'll find is that we'll have a much more healthier market in that buyers who can buy are better qualified um, to continue making payments. And the properties that are being appraised um, were not artificially inflated for whatever reasons existed. And there are a number of them. Um, but what I'm going to do is, and the goal is, is to go over some of the fundamentals that uh, apply to every appraisal anywhere in the country, um, rules that appraisers have to follow, um, and then talk about the sort of like the difference between the CMA and the appraisal. And I think I might start with that originally. Uh, you know, I'll start with that. Um, a CMA is designed to, to estimate a value for for what the home might sell, I guess. Uh, I mean, I'm using the term estimate only because that's a real appraisal term. It's a, a technical in, um, in, in terms of the usage. But the, uh, the CMA is designed to say this is what the home should sell for. Um, the appraisal is designed to say this is what the home is valued at for the purposes of financing to make a bank, a mortgage company comfortable with the financial investment that they're putting in that property. And um, I think one of the biggest differences is that, and, and it's, it's, it always strikes me um, how, the, how, how these, all the, the, the two elements still balance out between, let's say, the CMA, or between the selling side and the valuing side, 
is that appraisers work off of historical data, um, primarily, um, in terms of demonstrating the value. Whereas selling um, often works with active and future data, in that we're looking at, if you're taking someone around look, who's looking to buy, you're often looking at what's available in the market to buy, and what's available in the market, and a shortage of what's available in the market is what is driving the market today in an upward manner, in, in the pricing pressures and so forth. Whereas appraising is the reaction to those shortages, hypothetically, but again, it's, it's back in time versus current. So um, hopefully I'll bring it all around to tie it all together and make sense. But um, the, um, we'll go through it, let me, okay. Um, so the, um, basically, um, appraisers are held to an ethical standard um, that's uh, referred to as use path. It's not anything that anybody really has to remember, but those ethical standards aren't something that are easily conveyed in, a, in, in, in any, any type of process unless you go through appraising, appraising courses, but still they are, they are bound to certain ethical standards and um, sometimes that can influence an appraisal in ways that, or evaluation in ways that you might not expect and uh, I, I will touch upon that shortly. But at the base level, an appraiser is required to provide three closed sales all within 12 months. Um, historically, the goal of all the guidelines that are established for appraising were obviously often established by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, Fannie Mae being the leading one. Um, and historically, it was always sales over six uh, within six months and within a mile. That was a standard that everybody sort of mm. adhered to. Why would that be? Well, we want to reflect the current market. We want to reflect sales that are somewhat close to the home so we can accurately measure the neighborhood. So um, an appraiser is not guessing at, at sort of differences in location. Um, but over time, particularly within the past five to six years or so, um, Fannie Mae has developed a system of scoring appraisals in that every appraisal that's done for a bank or a mortgage company gets submitted to Fannie Mae and it goes into this enormous database and uh, it goes into a system and they um, and it scores appraisals but it also records and tracks all this data it's an enormous data pool where if you can imagine every sale of every home um, that had financing in some way um, and even sales of homes that didn't have financing that might have been used in appraisal are in Fannie Mae's database. And so from this they can measure um, in many ways the accuracy of appraisals or score them, which is then determined sort of a critique of the appraisal. But they eliminated in the past year these guidelines about six months and one mile because the computer system and the algorithm behind that is measuring it in a way that can identify, let's say, hypothetically, if you're in an area of, let's say, central Massachusetts, um, and more rural, and we were just talking about Dunstable, town of mm. small people, right? uh, what's the difference if we go four miles away to a half mile away? I mean, is there really a, 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 any kind of noticeable difference in value? Well, um, the database that Fannie has will identify that, but the reality is that this is the judgments that appraisers have always wanted to make to begin with. The reasoning for, again, choosing sales close by, it's not that appraisers don't have stopped choosing sales close by. It's um, the, the whole focus for that reason is so that the appraiser doesn't have to interpret any differences in location. What's the difference between extending the mileage and going over the town line? Uh, that's a good question. Um, sometimes no difference. Sometimes, absolutely can't do. But the appraiser will have to explain why he had to. And demonstrate why. Because yeah. you're, there's a, there, there, there has to be a reason based on the lack of sales, for one. Um, there also has to be a demonstration that property values within the two communities are equal. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the biggest eye-opener I had in, in my career, the first one of many, <laughs> is that I... Uh, I was in. I was doing an appraisal, and I'm originally from New Jersey, and 
I'd lived in the area for a while, um, but I was doing appraisal and it was in a uh, neighborhood in Tewksbury and uh, contemporary homes and very you know unusual large contemporary homes and so forth. And I just went across to Andover because it was right on the line. Yeah. Basically, could step over the line, and there were no sales like this home <laughs> at all. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and um, and I made adjustments to those sales, which I thought were reasonable, and and the adjustments that I made were in line with Fannie Mae's guidelines, which we, again we'll talk about, which was ten percent, because if you adjust a sale for one item, like say like location for difference, greater than ten percent, it implies that that home is no longer comparable. But I thought I was going to the extreme ten percent, and then they. This lender, for whatever reason, had my appraisal reviewed, and someone came out and found another sale considerably lower, which I wasn't thinking about because it was outside of, uh, I think, the, the, where the home was selling at, and a, lot, a variety of different reasons is why I didn't consider it. But once I did, I realized, oh my gosh, now I see sort of not just, it wasn't that I was unfamiliar with the area, I just felt that... I was focused more on the home than the location in that case. But, you know, appraisers can go to other towns many times. Um, if you can demonstrate, and, and it could be for um, a specific amenity, let's say water view, uh, lake view, mm. um, that's a good reason. Um, there's, a, there's a variety of different reasons. But, um, but it's nice to have that off. But still, at the, the end of the day, the appraisers want to look for... Um, something close by so they don't have to use any judgment um, and also as recent a sale as possible so particularly in, in eastern Massachusetts central Massachusetts just uh, you know relative to the other parts of the country and, and I uh, my company um, actually manages uh, appraisals uh, up and down the east coast from Florida to Maine um, California as well uh, very high high ends low ends uh, and so forth and you know, the markets are, are different. We have, I would say, the strongest market of any that I work in. Um, Northern California, sort of greater, you know, as we know, greater San Francisco area, it is always and still continues to be strong. But I've not seen a market that's that's approached what's happening here uh, consistently. Um, so, uh, which is great for, for homeowners, um, real estate agents and brokers, um, Challenging for appraisers um, <laughs> and, and buyers at times, um, but uh, so appraiser has to provide three closed sales. Um, after the financial bailout, there was a great focus on uh, providing active listings and pending sales as well, and the, and the reason for that was because not because of increasing values, but because of decreasing values. And and so obviously, if the house next door was listed for two hundred thousand, it's identical, and you can buy it and. And and this and the house you're appraising is selling for two ten. Why would you appraise it for two ten if you could buy the house next door for two hundred? Conversely, you know we're now more focused on using pending sales to support a rising value market. So um, the um, can you speak to that for a minute? Yeah. If you have to use a pending sale, you still have to have some sales as well. Absolutely, and the and the challenge. With the pending sale, and this is where it's that's gotten extraordinarily complicated. Is um, historically in every appraisal, um, there is a, a measurement of the sales to list price ratio, mm -hmm. and so um, you know, is it selling at ninety eight percent typically of list price, one hundred two percent, one hundred five, one hundred eight, which I've seen in a lot of communities. Mm -hmm. um, so what's flipped? challenging is that whether it's by design or by just a reflection of the market are the homes that are selling above list price. Five percent, two and a half, ten percent in some cases. So if you have a home hypothetically listed for five hundred thousand and the house that you're appraising is selling for five hundred and twenty five thousand, but that home that's selling for five hundred thousand is in a market that's showing a typical sales to list price ratio of 110% or 105%, and the appraiser can make an adjustment to that pending sale to show that, 
but at the end of the day, and as always is the case, the reliance on that pending sale, unless there's personal knowledge of it, in that the appraisers appraised it, our colleagues appraised it, they know specifically what the contract price is, they know with confidence, which again is a, you know, can or cannot be revealed, um, that the uh, the that the, um, the reliance on the pending sale, even though that may be the sale that demonstrates the value, goes away. And my question about that is, uh, do you call the agent yeah. to say how is this going to close, and are yes. there any closing? Co you know. Yes, and that's a good. It's always I'm always glad that that's asked because. Um, if anybody gets a call from an appraiser, mm. please um, do help everything them. you can to help them. Mm. Yeah, uh, because it's someone who's actually doing their job, and 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 by that individual doing their job is a domino effect of, because that may help one sale go through that might not have, and then lead to other ones, to other ones, to other ones. And so um, there are elements about what can be revealed. I don't know the ethics. I don't know, you know, I'm not a licensed real estate uh, agent broker um, but you know I know that there's however it can be conveyed about the you know if there's financing that has you know the commitment that date has been met and financing is in place it's great um, and if um, and if the selling telling the appraiser that it is selling above list price I don't think is uh, a breach of ethics but again I'm not the expert on that um, I think if uh, any kind of assistance you can provide to that appraiser about where it's selling is, is key. But at the end of the day, we're still working on appraisals that are um, based off of actual sales. Um, so what I'll do is um, I will show about how, how to demonstrate appreciation afterwards. But um, the next elements that, that involve, um, so again, going back to a CMA versus an appraisal, is that an appraisal... Is, is going to be um, the guy other additional guidelines that they have that appraisers have to follow. One has to do with the bracketing of elements within a house, and, and by that I mean um, if a house is two thousand square feet, a, a bank or a lender wants to see uh, houses that are slightly bigger, slightly smaller, and so forth. Um, if it's on an acre, they want to see slightly larger lots, slightly smaller lots. Um, and, and that's for the major elements of that. Um, what you can't have is a house that's on a, uh, let's say, a busy road and try to use all homes that are right around the corner but on a quiet side street in a subdivision um, as, as, as sales where the appraiser is making adjustments to all these sales. It's sort of like the example I gave of going across to the other town. Um, it, it becomes an unknown. So, for instance, if you have a home that's on a busy street, that appraiser's going to have to have, find a sale that's on a busy street to match it. Um, and because every element in some way tries to, has to be sort of proven or demonstrated. So, busy street, let's see a house that sells on a busy street. Home of a certain size, let's see a home of a certain size. And that more often applies to sort of, I wouldn't say unique homes, but homes that are either very large, very small, um, have no basement, have a basement, and so forth. Um, the key element and one of the biggest challenges, the differences between sort of how pricing is done to sell versus how appraisals are done is that in reality there's a, um, there are guidelines for what's referred to as net and gross percentage adjustments in an appraisal. And if no one's seen an appraisal, this can be confusing. But um, basically if you have a house that's on a busy street, and you're comparing it to a house that's on a quiet street, you're going to adjust the house that's on the quiet street um, because it's going to sell for more because it's on a quiet street relative to a busy street. And you're going to deduct that by a certain percentage or dollar amount. And that gets added up in total. And that refers refers to as the percentage guidelines, I mean percentage adjustments in one direction or another. So, hypothetically, yes? If you have a house that it's sitting on, let's say, half of an acre mm -hmm. on the city, and the house is not um, in the best conditions. How could you, 
how would you market that parcel mm. for better in uh, better use? Right. Whether it's you know the house is not in good condition. So right. Do you tear it down? Do you yes. Is that than tearing it down versus right versus renovating? And it's a uh, you know it, it's a it's a it's a great question because it's a. Uh, it really applies to some basic economics. I mean, it's economics based off of what we're skilled at, both in selling and and valuing. Is what is the analysis that would go into, you know, the cost of the renovation and then the return on that renovation, right? So you're going to be looking for, you know, to make that judgment. Um, is can I find anything similar that sold, you know, post renovation? Obviously, figuring out the renovation estimates, but that's easier said than done. Yes. Um, but then also, you know, the idea of sort of tearing it down, which has dominated a lot of communities, um, particularly along Route One Twenty Eight and so forth, Lexington, Needham, and so forth, um, where the um, it was, you know, the highest and best use, which is a, a key element in the appraisal. Um, was uh, to to tear it down and rebuild it, but the highest and best use analysis in an appraisal gets involved in four tests. Basically, is it does it make sense financially? Um, and one of the biggest ones is legal. Can it be done within the confines of what the zoning requires mm -hmm. and allows? So if that house is going to be torn down, um, how big of a house can you rebuild? And then if you can. If you maximize that, what then is that house selling for? So that's why homes, for instance, in um, in Weston, um, the, the difference in a two-acre versus a three-acre parcel, I could be wrong about the specifics of this, you know, leads to a home that's gigantic versus a home that's like a mega gigantic home. <laughs> and it may, be a, it may seem trivial because you're talking about the difference between the 6,000 square foot home and an eight to a nine thousand square foot home, but it matters in that buying demographic, um, and so that's where sort of the legal component to that lot. I mean, it's it's a very difficult challenge, you know. It's so basically the my answer would be the answer that I'm probably looking for is um, based upon the size, the yeah. size of the lot. It's in yeah. the city. Yes. It's in the city, so therefore... If it's, it's, in, if it's in the city... For zoning reasons, right? Yeah. If yeah. That's the answer. The, yes. The, you would have to check the zoning... Absolutely. ...first in yes. order to even do anything else. Without question. And really understand that well. And even, you know, there's, there's usually... Because I'm involved in developing in, in the city, East Boston, um, South Boston. Um, and, you know, what I've learned is, is remarkable. I mean, what you can do, you know, so... You have to understand things like uh, it's referred to as FAR, which is Florida area ratio. So if you have mm -hmm. a 2,000 square foot lot, you know, a FAR in South Boston is two. So if you've got a 2,000 square foot lot, that means you can build 4,000 square feet of residential. But if you're doing that, you also have to find a way to put in parking now, too, on top yeah. of it. And if that's the case, does it mean if you have a curb cut, things like that? So that becomes a very it's important to have a partner in some way who can help on just give generalized advice on, on the legalities from the zoning perspective. Um, spending time in a, in a building department, you know, okay. zoning department, is huge. Asking yeah, questions, it yeah, it really is. Um, and then um, if you're considering the, the renovation versus the teardown, you know, what type of renovation? Because it's ideally it's, it's just making it look pretty. You know, if you can make it look pretty and get away with just making it look pretty, it's going to be uh, a winner okay. versus having to redo the roof, electric, foundation, that down the line, you know, because those are things that you have money. Um, so appraisers in general, this is a sort of a generalized rule of thumb, are not likely going to pick comparable sales that are sell for certainly greater than 15% of what the home is selling at. So 500000 they're not going to go to sales over six hundred thousand, theoretically. You know, five seventy five would be the top, and on the low end, the same way. The other key element, and this is the one that usually has the most questions and so much variation within um, listings, 
is that, and, and, and I also feel like this is one of the most important guidelines that exists, is that a home that's a comparable sale uh, cannot be 25% greater or smaller in living area than the house that's being appraised. So, a thousand square foot home, 1250 down to 750 right? That would be the range. Now, that leads to the question of how do you define living area, right? Um, and the question, and the most relevant, you know, homes are split entry, raised ranch, ranch. Now, a lot of times, split entries and raised ranches are wrongly labeled. Sometimes they're labeled the way because the assessors call it a raised ranch, and now in turn it's listed as a raised ranch and a split entry. But a split entry is the door is in between the upper level and the lower level. And you can see it S split entry. Mm -hmm. And you walk in, and you can go upstairs or you can go downstairs. Mm -hmm. And a raised ranch is just that. You walk in, and you go up a flight of stairs, and upstairs is the kitchen, bedrooms, and baths, and so forth. And the top of the door is at the bottom of that second level. It's not a big difference, but it kind of is, because it's weird when you're figuring out the living area. Because raised ranches um, are treated the way, typically, as, as split entries are. And there are a lot fewer of those out there. Um, but appraisers aren't just coming up with this rule on their own. Um, assessors do it the same way. Um, it's also a national standard for, for building and so forth. But on anything that's partially below grade is considered to be below grade. That means the lower level of a split entry is considered to be basement or lower level. Now this is very... Um, when you look at the majority of homes in, in MLS, you will see um, a split level, we'll call them the same thing, splits, raised ranches for purpose. Um, 2,200 square feet, 2,400 square feet, because the lower level is finished, upper level is finished, add the two together, you get your number. Um, but if you look, go to the assessing, and, and, and the assessor's records is not just clicking on um, public records within the multiple listing. It's going to the town of Chelmsford assessors data. Uh, I, I would just, if I'm looking in Chelmsford, I go Chelmsford assessor, Chelmsford mass assessors um, database. And within there, there's a discrimination between uh, gross living area or total living area and finished living area. And the finished living area will break out the lower level that's finished and the upper level. But in an appraisal, and I can show you this right here, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to see it, um, or even if I can point to it, but I can. I just don't know if it'll be how visible, but there's a section in the middle of this appraisal which shows a room count. And you'll see 631 for the first sale, and 1144 is the square footage. And it says gross living area. And then below that is basement and finished rooms below grade. So it's not that as if the lower level is excluded in the valuation. It's just that the lower level is excluded from the living area calculation in a raised ranch, in a split, in a ranch, in a colonial that has a finished basement. You don't include the, that in it. It just gets handled separately. How does the finished third floor work? That's a great question. I like that one because in my observations and I see because my company we can we'll manage upwards of 1500 to 2000 appraisals a month. So we'll see a lot of appraisals come through. Um, I've always been an advocate that the third floor um, should be treated differently than the first and second floor. Okay. Um, I don't see it happening all the way, and it really is somewhat dependent on the comparable sales. Um, if all all the comparable sales all have finished third floors, then it should all be counted. But if you have 2,400 square feet of a home that's being appraised spread out over two levels as compared to a house that's 2,400 square feet spread out over three levels, I think there's a difference, and there's a difference in the feel um, on those two those two levels. Um, the the first of the you know 
the one that's over two levels is going to be feel more spacious than the one that's over three levels. It's um, not to mention going up, you know, three floors, and so forth. Um, and you know, I think to appraisers will adjust um, for differences in living here. I, I would I would treat it separately as a line item adjustment by saying line item adjustment meaning like treating it like a, um, a garage, a patio, a porch, a pool, a lower level. Um, but basically just adjusting it for the difference in living area for that third floor, but slightly less than you would for the other area. Mm. Still equally valuable, but it's almost like an amenity. I have another question. So if you're a listing agent, there's a lot of different ways that we can list the gross living area in MLS. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any one. Maybe you have a preference of how people do it. But let's say we put in 2,000 square feet, and then we there's a disclosure area that we can say nine, 900 of that, which would probably not be. But let's say 600 is finished basement right. space. That way it at least reflects what's on the lower level. It does. Is that enough? It is. To see? It is. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, in a perfect world, if we were all working... On the, the same, same platform, yeah. it wouldn't be that handled that way. You would, rather 600, see it would be the, broken you would rather see the first quality, the first and second floor, as the number on yeah. top, and then say an additional 600. That's how you would like to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because what happens is that now this, this, that feeds the databases from all the online valuation. So right. the appraisers have to be careful looking at that to see how the listing agent put that number together. Appraiser has to verify that mm. from the assessors. Mm. And so the question comes in is, does the buyer think that they're buying a home of a certain size? It's not that it's not, it's not that that, that level isn't the level that's finished. Mm. It's just that it's, you know, they are buying 2,000 square feet of right. finished area, but from from a valuation method, from an assessing method, from a general comparison method, that 2,000 square feet isn't the same as, let's say, a, a 2,000 square foot colonial that also has a full basement underneath it that you can store stuff in, mm -hmm. that you might be able to finish off in the, in the future, that your furnace, you know, is, is there, and your electrical panel, and, you know, all those other things, because that's, you know, that, that's what differs so when, when and it's a, this is the problem in sort of sort of cross comparison of styles if you um, if you're comparing it only if you have a split level home that is 2,000 up and down and it's only compared to other split level homes that are all the same size also finished in the lower level all 2,000 square feet it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. at that point because they're all basically the same home the problem comes in is when you compare it to a, a colonial or a cape, hypothetically, that is that. Because that's two stories of finished above grade, fully above grade. And again, how much is, 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 a, is a full basement worth as compared to a home? Technically now, it doesn't have a basement because it's now a living area. You know, that's and So again, the like style is a real problem. It is. Because you guys have to be really careful about that. Very much so. See, because the whole thing about appraising and why they, there's this... There are guidelines to follow, but the truth is, is you just you don't want you want to take any kind of judgment or interpretation um, or relying on experience out of the the appraisal process. You, I mean, you know, ideally you want to have all of these comparable sales and not make any adjustments at all. That's the purpose. That's the goal of the appraisal. Um, the, so can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Like um, colonials, you'd have colonial garrison things yeah. like that. Can you include a cape? With you, a can. you can. You know, can. Or it, is, a gambrel or Yeah, I mean it, you know, is a cape less valuable than a colonial? Well maybe sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, often it is because capes are often smaller than colonials. Is it a design feature or is it just a size feature? You know, if you brought that cape somehow and it was dormered in the back and now yes. it's brought up to the same square footage as that colonial, right. is it buyer well it kinda of then it starts well what's going on on the inside? You know, is it, is it, you know, how, how, what's the level of finish and renovation and updating or not updating and so forth. So it becomes sort of quasi-guessing, you know, I mean, it, it, it really, it can be used in comparison, but again, ideally you're looking for like to like, 
and it's it, and not to cut you off. But yeah, go ahead. That's all right. Well, the, so uh, the two things that are hard. One is a split level, and the other one is a ranch. So yeah. a split level you wouldn't or can't necessarily compare to a um, split gambrel. Um, that's. Hard to say, but yeah, yeah I mean, you you, you kind of could, but not really. Right, and a ranch. Ranch, you know, ranch and splits often do get compared. Do they? Yeah, they often do. Um, and in. But it's only when there's a lack of other one. It's 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 to just sort of perhaps, you know, because the appraiser may be relying on. One or two sales as their primary, value indicators. So yesterday we were talking about slabs because we have tons of them in in Chelmsford. Yeah. You know, what would Campanelli. you do? Yeah. What yeah. would you do with a regular a ranch? Yeah, a regular ranch <laughs> versus a slab. I mean, that's again. It's tough, right? That's it's, tough for you. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, it, it's um. I often see, and you know, it it should be. It really should be price dependent, right? Because, it, it, there's a focus on sort of like what's this worth, right? And so it's like. You know, a lot of appraisers, including myself, usually make adjustments in the range of ten thousand to fifteen thousand for the lack of a basement. You know, a slab as compared to a, a home that has a full unfinished basement. Mm. But then if you throw in a level of finish to that basement that you're comparing it to, you're now getting really dissimilar homes. Now you're starting to make a lot of adjustments and you're starting to then erode the confidence level in that comparable sale. Um, it makes us respect more and more the difficult job of the appraiser. It is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, what's funny is like, you know, the the with MLS and it's I don't want to sound dated or anything like that, but they, uh, you know, pre-internet, um, for for gathering data, appraisers had to go to a real estate office. You know, they would be appraising a house and in town, stop by the first real estate office they see. Ask to look at the comp books. Oh, I remember yeah. that. And ask to, and you know, beg and you know, sort of plead to photocopy a page or two if possible. Um, but the but the reality is, like when when you do it, you'd, you'd be you'd be looking through the through the pages and, and you'd say that house looks like mine, that house looks like mine, this house looks like mine, mm. right? And you weren't sort of just typing in and plotting it on a map and instantly and, and working in that sort of criteria or saying, I want three bedroom homes. And, Four bedroom, this square footage to this square footage. Um, so, but, but going back to the square footage question and the design question and so forth, you know, as an appraiser searching for comparable sales, um, a lot of them do it differently, unfortunately, and there's not uh, always the consistency that I would like to see um, because it what it does is it narrows their frame of view. But um, searching for square footage, unless it's a condo, you know, I never search on square footage um, if I'm searching for comparable sales I do one of two things if depending on where the property is if it's in an area that's you can clearly see it's is, is, is it sort of separated by some clearly identifiable boundaries you know it could be you know 495 on one side and, you know or whatever 173 on another or this you know and, and I will go into the map search feature of MLS, mm -hmm. um, I will not put in any criteria other than I'll draw an outline of an area that I think is the generalized area. I'll say I will search generally back ten months. Um, I will put in no style. I'll put in nothing. I'll say just give me all the sales that took place in this area in this time frame. And then you know now if the house is selling, let's say for five hundred thousand, I'll ease it. You know I mean start like. 350,000 hypothetically just so I don't but then then just start focusing on location location trying to find what's close by seeing a general price trend within that area and then you just have to start going in and breaking out the details of the home yes. let's talk about location if we may mm. so the difference between a house being on Main Street USA and being in a subdivision on a cul-de-sac yeah that's meaningful to the appraisal hugely hugely and, um, and, and and if it's on Main Street USA, they need to find something that's also on Main Street USA. And if it's not on Main Street, then it's got to be on sort of, uh, you know, Main Street B, you know, uh, something.
close or nearby or something along those so, lines. But the opposite. So if the house that you were appraising is at the end of a cul-de-sac, yeah. you might not necessarily use the appraisal on Main Street because that's a horse of a different color. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't. Okay. And, and that one of the things about that is just usually, I mean, you'd have to, it, it takes a little bit to figure it out at times, but um, usually the difference between the selling price on the Main Street versus the cul-de-sac is so great that the... Um, it exceeds it. It's a specific mm -hmm. guideline from mm -hmm. Fannie Mae for kicking it out. Um, the one problem that I have in the, that in the whole appraisal industry that I would recommend anybody, um, I'm not sure how to say it or how to, how it would be to put it across during an appraisal inspection is if there are certain elements about the location of the home that's being appraised, that's key. Let's say it is on the end of a cul-de-sac, is to really highlight those differences of the homes. The, comp the potential comparable sale homes. As a positive. To say, yeah, to say, look, this house is not on a cul-de-sac, and you yes. should drive by it. Mm. So, so, see, that's the problem. Like, now you have Google, you can have Street View. I don't I don't think a lot of... It, the bottom line is appraisers should drive by these comparable mm -hmm. sales every single time. There's no excuse why they should not. Um, but a lot don't. And a lot don't because of mapping technology, satellite technology. And I don't, I'm not even sure that they even... Um, I question sometimes if they even, because I get pulled into situations all day long where someone's questioning their value, and I go back and I start researching, and then that's how I start researching it, usually from street view or from satellite view, to see it, is there something wrong about the comparables that were used. And you find a railroad track in the back that mm -hmm. wasn't picked up for. But anyhow, um, but yeah, so the um, the proximity and so forth, um, that, that is key. Having appraisers drive by those, um, you know the, uh, but really we're looking at um, that there's a, I think there's a, a greater freedom that appraisers have now for selecting comparable sales because of some of the reduction in guidelines, um, but there's also greater scrutiny, and and I can show an example of what I mean by this. This is something that's. Um, uh, Um, can't really blow, blow this up that much more, but the uh, this is a, a report from Fannie Mae, and this is what I was talking about originally. Um, see, appraisers, what, what's often people think that an appraiser came comes out and they, they had a bad attitude or they didn't like the house or there was this type of thing. Does opinion matter? Yes, opinion does matter. Um, does the opinion of the appraiser matter above all? Absolutely not. So if I think a home is worth something, and I put it down, and I've been doing this for 30 years, no one cares what I think. I still have to prove that. And and how I'm proving it, though, is less, it's sometimes a little bit less human-based than it was previously. Mm -hmm. So my company, when we get these appraisals in, we have to submit it to Fannie and Freddie's system. And HUD has a system as well for FHA appraisals. And it ranks it. And it ranks in a score of zero or one to five, the appraisal. And if it's at a two point five or less, that basically says we're comfortable with it, and it holds the lender involved. Basically, uh, they, 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 there's no sort of um, no potential fi financial liability associated with this loan, based off of the appraisal. Right? So, as an underwriter, if they see that score. They're like, fantastic, I'm off the hook, I'm signing it. Now what if the score is a three or a four? Um, and it starts, and what you're doing is the, the, this collection of data. Uh, so what? So the appraisers are, are now having to respond, because once an appraisal is submitted, I'd say at a minimum 50%, and probably greater, there's a request to have follow-up revisions to that appraisal. Sometimes two, sometimes three, five, eight. Constantly, can you provide another sale that's closer, a little more similar in age? Can you provide another, you know, can you clarify about the condition of the shown in the photo? Can you... Um, You're asking the appraiser back or the listing broker? Who are you asking? No, the, 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 the lender is asking the, the appraiser uh, these questions back. Okay. Yeah. And how long does that process take? It could take, uh, hopefully it's quick, but it's... You're talking could take weeks, depending on what the what the questions are. 
Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I was appraising, uh, I, was, I was working on a condominium in, on the Cape and um, in Osterville. And it was uh, a renovated unit, um, complicated because it was the only unit of its design in that it was offset from the other units in the project. That's Osterville. You know, it's clearly the most valuable village in Barnstable. Um, clearly the most valuable, one of the most, you know, top two or three, if not the, in, in all of eastern Massachusetts, all Massachusetts. Um, and, um, but, so, my sales were, I pulled sales from 19 miles away, 5 miles away. I went from Osterville to Harwich. Um, I went all around Barnstable. Um, and so the questions that came back to me on this were, um, you know, how do you feel like this house is worth it if you only have one sale, hypothetically, that's, you know, supporting the value? Um, now the question was wrong. It was I actually had more than that, but I had to go in and then statistically demonstrate why this town was higher than that. So that sort of the one question it might be. Um, but then there's other questions that just come back that come from Fannie Mae system. They'll say basically other based on other appraisals submitted or based on other peer models. Um, you know the living area of your comparable three seems wrong is low should be this or it should be so what you also find is that there's a a comparison back to um, public records mm -hmm. which is really confusing because public records isn't necessarily accurate yes <laughs> yeah the you assessors know, I, are I was going to speak to that back to the gross living area yeah. um, all towns are different I listed a house this week, this past weekend, that it had the full amount. Let's say it was twenty two thousand ninety two, and then it has quite a bit finished in the lower level, and that was zero. Yeah. So from town to town, it depends on what a thorough job they've done, how recently they've done the job, and I like deferring to public records only because. You can say the source was public records, yeah. and that's where the number came from. But in some cases, if it's zero, it's incomplete. It is. Mm -hmm. That's why it's mm -hmm. sort of like, I mean, the, the right way to do it every single time is just Google, go into the assessors for that town, and look at how they break down the square footage, and make sure that you're putting in what's considered to be just a finished area. That's the right way to do it. Every time, because mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know if uh, sometimes for whatever reason you know they'll include porches, they'll include patios, they'll, you know they'll take everything, you know garages. So sometimes they'll do basements. Um, that segues next. Uh, can you speak to garages a little bit? Yes, um, you know I think garages are probably less less recognized than they should be in the appraisal. So it's very difficult for us as a listing agent, and you guys haven't really been there. It's hard in MLS to to even say, is it attached, detached, under right. all of these different things, and uh, it is. Oh, and yeah, then, I'm not sure how then, you... then the appraiser's looking at it too and saying, you know, okay, so what is this, or is it a, just a carport for heaven's sake? Right. So, I mean, it really. I mean. The, the good appraiser is the one that recognizes this is a this is a garage that's built in, it's in the lower level, mm -hmm. it's taking up forty percent of the basement yes. that might be finished off. That's true. That might be used for storage or whatever, um, and uh, you know, and that's where the adjustments should be made. And and, and I'm I'm critical of, of you know of all industries. I just think it you know everything gets better sort of through education. Do you, yeah, you guys understand that if you had a colonial and it had a two-car attached garage, it would be much more valuable than a colonial that had a garage under. Garage, when a builder is building his price per square foot, it costs him a lot more to build that two-car attached garage because that's like a separate little building mm -hmm. attached to the house. And the other thing that Colin was just saying is by having it underneath, the garage is taking up a big yes. portion of the basement. Yes. So. You don't have that much other space. Now, it's also usually a reflection of the site that the home's being built on, too. 
The site where the yes. attached garage is is wider, has more yes. frontage. It's a better site. Um, everything about it is, is generally better. So, you know, having a larger frontage, you know, it's much more, so you're not necessarily dealing with a narrow lot. So, and usually if you have a built-in garage, it's often you'll go down and turn in, you know what I mean? And, and so, because the site is sloping and someone's just making, you know what I mean, doing their best with the with what they have to work with. Well, to, sorry to argue that no. point, but what's your difference in whether there's a walk-up basement or not? I mean, because that's reflected yeah. in the sloping lots. I know, no, you're absolutely right about that. That's, uh, there should be a difference. There should be a difference. And it's a question on whether or not it can actually be properly identified in the grade. Now, the beauty of much of what we were talking about before, photography, yes. videography, and so forth, is that you're now immersed into the home, and mm -hmm. it's only going to get better. And you're going to have a better feel of that. So do you, do you guys understand? Sometimes you might have a regular basement that just has a bulkhead. You know, the swinging doors that open and you go into the basement mm -hmm. as a basement. When you have a sloping lot that goes down to the back, that sometimes makes you able to have a set of sliders and daylight windows, which makes the downstairs much more open and usable. Now, one of the things in, the, in this uh, slide that I have, and whether you can see it or not, um, it, it's a, basically this system that gets sent to Fannie Mae. A lot of... There's a lot of abbreviations that are used, or sort of categorizations, both for rating the home in terms of its its condition, uh, its level of quality, um, but also, like for instance, in the basement, how areas are categorized. So they ask the question: How big is it square footage? How big is it square footage finished? They ask the question: Walk out, walk up. Um, yeah, just walk out or walk up. Um, and then they ask you to categorize the rooms that are finished in the lower level. Now that was a real great change that Fannie made when they did this. Because historically appraisers were just, a lot of them, the ones that weren't sort of reading closely, were just lumping, you know, a home with a family room as compared to a home with a family room, a bedroom, and a bathroom, all together as full finished, a uh, basement mm. full finished. Now they have to break it out, and by breaking it out, they're giving extra value to the bathroom versus when in the past they didn't. Do they give value to the walkout versus the walk-up? I'm going to say that for the most part, they don't. And they should. Wow. And they should. Um, what about bathrooms as far as the difference between half, three-quarter, and full? I mean, there's still a lot of confusion about that. Three-quarters is a full. That's what in I the eyes of numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And what about... Um, a regular surround versus tile? Yeah. Do you um, credit for that? Not to that level. Not too usually. much. I mean, what happens is like it, it might fall into the generalized category about the, the overall quality of the home. You know, mm -hmm. so if someone does a, a better job, let's say, in the bathroom, does that also translate into what they've done in the rest of the house okay. and carry it through? Because you'll often see about those types of scenarios. So all of what we're talking about goes back to when you're sitting with the, your sellers. And you're explaining to them the importance of Colin's job, that you want to try to explain when the buyer get, gets the appraiser to come out to the property, we want all of that to go well. And that's why you're kind of talking uh, like an appraiser would when you're listing the property, because you want to make sure they understand that that's what they have to wait for in the process, is the appraiser to come in on the property. Yeah, and, the, and you know, the one, the, the biggest tip that I can always, I, I would offer, is that the, um, you know, I was saying how I go about researching the value of a home. And I try to work with a blank slate, nothing, no predetermined values. Um, I, I always work with a blank slate. But again, I say if I'm looking at a certain area, see what kind of home sold in the area. So let's say you, you are trying to price a house in a neighborhood, and the neighborhood is relatively contained, you know, a couple of streets and so forth. And, and so there's a house around the corner same neighborhood that sold for say twenty five thousand less than what you think you want to list this house for, or what the sellers want to sell it for. Mm -hmm. Right, even worse, right? Because that's mm -hmm. where you're mm -hmm. trying to convince them what to list it at. Um, now, if this house were to be sell at the list price twenty five thousand higher, and you've got this comparable that just sold, or this home that just sold, so for all intents and purposes, I is identical. How are you going to explain this away for to the appraiser? 
So, for instance, like the recommendation is always to give the appraiser comparable sales when you see them at a. So yeah, when someone comes in, you meet the appraiser, let them walk through. You know, you can walk with the appraiser, and, and it's good too. If, you, if there are things that you want to point out with the house, walk through, point those things out, and so forth. Um, I will say that it can be hard for appraisers to walk, draw a floor plan, observe, and talk at the same time, mm. and and retain what they're what you're talking about. You know. It's better to let them sort of walk through, do their observations so they can do that in that manner, and then perhaps then, then go back and, and make sure that you set aside the time to, to have that conversation. Um, but the sales that, it's great to bring sales that you feel are, are, are supportive of what the home is selling at. Um, it's also equally important to talk about the sales that are not supportive. And, per, and to find a reason why they're not. Okay? So, it so could that be, they can discount those, is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. So now here's where it comes in. Walkout versus, mm. you know, a great walkout basement versus one that isn't. You know, um, built-in garage, you know, a garage under versus attached. Now, the appraiser may look at these two homes, they may look, look almost identical, but those subtleties can is what builds up, you know, the, the evidence to say, yes, this house is worth this much more. So you got it was you. It's not like the appraiser is just going to accidentally miss it. <laughs> you know, you can yeah. hope that they're not going to oh, pick yeah. up on the sale. They're going to find it. Um, so it's about talking about it. Maybe there are certain circumstances about the seller. You know, who knows? Around the sale, the transaction, whatever the case might be. Um, one element to look at, I could say too, is uh, when a home sells, let's say for. Is it five hundred forty thousand? And let's say it's got six thousand in, in sellers' concessions, mm. financing concessions. Ask about that. The um, so the financing concessions, sellers assisting the buyer, um, and that's noted in, in the listing. That gets deducted from the five hundred forty thousand. Not always, but that's usually what happens because the reality is that. That for the average buyer out there, they've got to pay that six thousand dollars. Now, if in the case of this one house, you know, that someone came by in this one house as an enticement to it, well, realistically, they're not paying as much as the normal person would pay, so it gets deducted. Um, now, if all the comparable sales have sales concessions, that's both a mm. observation of the market that it's sort of needed. You know, or it's an observation of the market, and that's just how the market works. So everybody, the sellers probably pay sell it, you know, concessions. So when you find it routinely, which is something that the appraiser has to comment on, do you find selling concessions frequent? Um, the, uh, you know, it, then then they don't have to make the adjustment. But for ninety five percent of the time, that gets taken off the price, and that's often one of the biggest issues that I see. Um, you know, where it really comes to light a lot is in condo projects where you have identical units selling. And those identical units, you know, one out of the two, you know, whatever, sold high. Um, and it sold high, and that's the one that had the concessions. It gets taken off. Yeah. So it's challenging. Um, I think the last thing I would want to touch upon, um, it's just, it's a quick uh, discussion about how do you measure rates of appreciation? How do you measure that the market's going up or down? Right? What's the right way to do it? Um, because it's, that's, you know, you, you, we've been in markets where you've got properties where I've got 10 offers on this house, right? Or, you know, 10 people interested in this property and it's driving the price up, 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 up. I mean, it was commonplace. Um, how do you measure that? Well, that one, that one is a tough one to measure, you know, because it's sort of like, if it's if it's pushed it up so high, well, it's not so much measuring just the, that that was a reaction to this one home. It still has to meet the test of valuation at the end of the day, and so if someone's doing that, that buyer should be advised to be prepared that whatever they're thinking about putting as a down payment, if it was 
meeting the minimum standards, let's say 20% or 5% or whatever the case might be, they might be, are you prepared to put down more money? Because this might very well not be appraise down. Um, but Fannie Mae had established a, a, a method of uh, measuring the market, which was breaking up. It's not comparing, let's say, the median price range from last year as of this date, hypothetically, to you know to to, to today measuring the last year, meaning like year year to year comparison, median price. They broke it up in the past twelve months which makes sense. And they broke up the last 12 months into three segments. The first six months at the start of the last 12 months, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then the last six, the most recent six months into two quarters, right? Into three months and three months. And it was, uh, I think it was accurate, right? Because the appraiser is only going to be using comparable sales that sold within the last 12 months. So you want to know what was the market like when those comparable sales sold. So obviously, if he has an easy time of it, if he has tons of comps yeah. to support, he will go with that short period of time that is the most recent. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then you, and, and the reason why is because I was talking about the number of requests that come back to appraisers on a regular basis to change this, to tweak this, to comment on this, to blah, blah, blah. The, what the goal of the appraisal is, is to streamline it, right? Is to do, is to meet all these, the guidelines are, are are in place because they, they, they sort of, in the end, help develop a product that is uh, trustworthy, um, accurate, and so forth. Um, um, but appraisers want to adhere to the guidelines in many ways because they don't want to be bothered again after they submit this so appraisal. So do you get this request from the seller or the bank? The list of, or the bank? Yeah, the bank and the mortgage company. Uh, because of what? Because um, they have to ultimately, if they're making the loan, um, in order to make the loan, usually they're in turn selling that loan to, to um, I don't know, what's referred to as an investor, which is usually a bigger bank, you know, um, or selling it direct to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, uh, or HUD, hypothetically. So, um, so you think they want to make most out of their investment is that what you see? No, they want to make sure that this product, that this, um, in order to sell that loan, mm -hmm. that every part of that loan has to be perfect or meet the criteria. And the appraisal is just one component to it. It's 50%. Um, the rest is the buyer's credit and so forth and you know qualification standards. But, you know, as it pertains to the appraisal, mm -hmm. they got to make sure that that thing's not going to be come back and question again because if it's questioned if they say that they, they make a judgment and say yep we're going to lend on this and they approve it and so forth and they, and it's easily questioned come back that they have to first buy back the loan that means buy back the loan <laughs> you know? mm. a $600,000 loan you know $300,000 loan they got to come up with the money get it back and then what do they do with it you know then they have to either you know it's a very scary situation so Lenders would be scared in a lot of cases. Appraisers would be scared because they're, you know, like I said, so many actions against them, so forth. But you know, but by sharing of information, all everybody being on the same table, it is remarkable how the whole system does work at the end of the day. Do you have the cards with you? Or? I do. I would. I will find those cards and. Yeah, take them out. Super. Thank you that. very much. Great beginning thank for you. all of us oh, to get an understanding of how important it is. And just want to remind everyone that the manuals for this is in Jostle in our library under the four-week agent training. Okay. I forgot to say that at the beginning.